Okay, ladies and gentlemen of the Western community and beyond, thank you so much for waiting for the start of the event. We really apologize about the delay, um, but either way, we really are thankful that you could make it tonight to our event. And just to introduce myself, I am a coordinator of CORE. I'm Alex and I, uh, I manage the student affairs side of uh, the CORE London branch. And with me is Rudra, who is also a co-coordinator. And this is our fourth event of the year. And it's called Get Published, How to Get Involved in Independent Research. Now, if you haven't heard of us before, uh, the Canadian Organization for Undergraduate Health Research, that's our full name, we follow three basic pillars to guide our mission statement. Uh, the first one being helping provide research opportunities to underrepresented students specifically. And second, we offer events year round to help students improve skills that can be useful uh, for research. And thirdly, we published infographics that make science more accessible, not just within the scientific community, but broader to the general population, the lay audience. So in our event today specifically, we hope that we can get some of your pressing questions about what exactly is independent research and how will you be able to participate in independent research? Uh, and the likes of those questions answered tonight and we are very excited to also have an esteemed guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Garcia Bornism, who is a clinician scientist here at Western. And we will conclude uh, this event with a question period so that you can ask more specific questions either to us or Dr. Garcia. Now, before we dive into the program itself, we wanted to give everyone a background on how it was conceived in the first place, because it follows a rather unusual structure around the idea of independent research. It's also one of the fewest student run, run program, at least at the undergraduate level. And it's also the mainstay of what CORE is trying to accomplish, which is to provide research opportunities for undergraduate students. And we would like to start with the summer infographic series. Uh, specifically, it's we started a social media campaign at the onset of the pandemic. Um, and we had a few options to keep us busy at the time to and make a social impact with science. One of the biggest issues that we encountered during the pandemic is not just a virus, but also misinformation on social media. And there's a lot of work to be done to facilitate scientific communication. And we thought that doing it through visual communication could be one of uh, the few effective ways to alleviate an infodemic. So we tackled COVID related topic, uh, COVID specific related topics like uh, vaccines, uh, domestic violence and food transmission. And eventually it became a much um, bigger project. One of them being the Insight, which is our year long journal of uh, illustrated science where we consistently publish infographics about interesting science topics. And the second, is our research project. So again, in the start of the summer 2020, we started our social media campaign called Staying Current with COVID. And then in June, because of the such a um, great feedback that we got from our readers, we were also wondering how effective were our social media campaign in facilitating scientific communication. And we were thinking about how we should formulate a research question. We did lots of literature review surrounding the effectiveness of infographics. And eventually we also created a methodology and developed a survey. Um, and one step at a time, we eventually also received um, research ethics approval from Western. And this gave us the go to release our survey to the, um, the Western community and obtain data. And this happened in September, 2020. And a few months later, um, we finished collecting our data and we received over 350 responses. And we also obtained faculty supervisors uh, in the Department of Sociology and Science uh, to guide our research into the right direction so that it's specific and is publishable. And today we are sitting with a completed manuscript that's ready to be 
uh, peer reviewed in various journals. So here's a sneak peek of what the manuscript looks like so far. Um, it's really it's a really humbling experience that from what began as an ordinary social media campaign, eventually is translated into a full fledged study, and it's now written in a format that can be submitted to um, scientific journals. There's a lot of team effort that went into this within the core team. There's a lot of coordination for teamwork and developing a sound research methodology so that the data is reliable and precise. And we were wondering if this model can potentially be applied to people outside of our core team, uh, specifically the Western community. We've been trying uh, a few years implementing this program at Western and we are very hopeful that this is perhaps the year where um, there's a scarcity of research opportunities during COVID, but also in general. It's very competitive to get a research position as an undergraduate. And we are hoping that this model of independent research can perhaps be one of the solutions um, that we can implement for the long term. And I would like to invite Rudra, um, who's going to be talking more in depth about the program itself. Take it away, Rudra. Thank you, Alex. Uh, as Alex mentioned before, I'm the coordinator of research affairs at CORE London, and I will be taking you guys through the summer research program for 2021. So if Alex, if you could switch to the next slide, please. So just to give you guys a brief overview of the program, we are planning a 16 week program from May to August. Uh, you guys will be conducting remote research in a clinical epidemiology setting at Western University. You guys will get to work with a team of students, mentors, and a PI to conduct research. And at the end of the program, you will get a certification offered, as well as a chance to present at a conference and a pu publish an abstract. Next slide, please. So when we were coming up with this program, we had a few learning objectives in mind, which I'll go through right now. Uh, the main uh, learning objective is to apply the scientific method within a clinical context. Uh, you guys will get to work as a research team, uh, like I mentioned before, to produce meaningful data. You guys will learn how to be responsible for achieving high standards of ethics and precision in your research. Also learn how to use current literature and knowledge to interpret your research findings that you get through the program. And finally, at the end of it all, construct your own research narrative by understanding and participating in going through the peer review publication process. So, you know, what are we looking for for students in this program? When we were coming up with these basic eligibility criteria, we wanted to maintain a balance between making research as accessible as possible while ensuring that the students we pick are able to handle the academic rigor of conducting research. So here are some of the requirements that we hope for. This program is only open to undergraduates in the Faculty of Science or Basic Medical Sciences from Western University. Uh, Applicants must also hold a cumulative GPA of at least a 3.7 out of four, which is 80% or higher. Uh, we will also be taking a look at your online unofficial transcript, as well as a resume or CV. CORE is all about providing research opportunities to underrepresented students uh, and students who have never had research opportunities before. So preferences will be given to those who have not participated in any form of research before. This is also the, a student-led program, and it's the first time that we are holding this. So we want students that apply to be committed to our program. So we will be giving preferences to students who have not applied to any other research grants in this year, uh, including NSERC, DUROP, or any Western or non-Western uh, research grants. So uh, I, I saw a question in the chat about the application, so now I'll go through the application. We tried to keep the application as simple as possible so that as many people uh, as possible can apply. Uh, so we will be asking you guys about some basic uh, background information, uh, your GPA, transcripts, and CV, as I mentioned before. And we have just two short essay questions that we look for in the application. Uh, the first one is a statement of research interest, which is 200 words. Uh, in this question, you'll just get to describe to us what kind of research areas you're interested in, what drives you, what you're passionate about, and you know, within your couple years at Western, what do you find interesting in science in general? The second question is your statement of underrepresentation. So at CORE, we often get this question about who is considered an underrepresented students. And you know, it is impossible for us to define underrepresentation simply because everyone comes from a different walk in life and 
everyone has different experiences. So in this uh, statement of underrepresentation, we will give you guys the chance to describe to us how you felt you have been underrepresented in the community. And that'll be a 300 word essay. And all in all, the deadline to submit this application will be on March 1st, 2021 uh, at midnight. So the project you guys will be conducting remotely is going to be a systematic review project. So just to give you guys a general background on what a systematic review is, if you guys take a look at the diagram on the left, pretend that each of those small yellow triangles are individual studies. So what the systematic review process does is it takes all these different studies within any given topic, every possible study, and it churns it and it sort of processes it to make a final product, which is a, you know, like a research narrative that sort of describes and answers that research question. So there are seven main steps within systematic review. Uh, the firstly, you have to determine your research question, flesh out your topic, write the proposal, search for studies in any literature database, uh, screen and filter out studies which are relevant versus non-relevant, uh, extract data from the relevant studies, conduct analysis on this data, and come to a conclusion uh, and write the manuscript based on your data analysis at the end of it. We're going to ask our students to apply these systematic review concepts within two general research areas, as you guys can see on the screen. The first is, uh, so again, just to give a little background, you know, with, uh, with the recent legalization of cannabis, research in clinical setting is highly needed and it's very required right now. So here, this, these are the two general topics. The first one is cannabis use in medical treatment for pregnant women and children. And the second is mechanistic interaction between CBD and other drug treatments. These topics were graciously offered to us by Dr. Garcia Bernison. Uh, so Dr. Okay. Garcia Bernison uh, is a pediatrician, clinical clinician scientist, and a clinical pharmacologist who trained in Argentina and Canada. He obtained his MD and pediatric specialty degree from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. He later did his PhD clinical pharmacology fellowship and clinician scientist training at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And, you know, we're very happy to have him here with us today. And let's all virtually give it up for Dr. Garcia Bernison. You can take it away. Thank, thanks a lot for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, so we, we have discussed uh, that I, maybe I, I could talk a bit about my uh, personal research background. Um, and then kind of outline very briefly uh, some of the uh, research projects that, that we have discussed, and then we will have questions, which might be the, the, the best use of the time. Um, so again, I'm really sorry I'm late. The, um, so just to give you a bit of, a, of background, so I, you kind of mentioned that, uh, no, I'm, I'm a pediatrician. I was trained, I trained in medicine and in pediatrics in Argentina. Uh, and then I, I moved to Canada, uh, to Toronto, first to Montreal to do research in pharmacogenetics, and then to Toronto to do the fellowship in clinical pharmacology and my PhD and some training as clinician scientist. Uh, I did quite a bit of research in, uh, at the hospital for six years in Toronto, and um, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of great people and publish uh, quite a few papers on different things related to pharmacology, especially uh, related to pharmacology and some toxicology and pediatrics um, at the time, and this is still to some extent true uh, now. Um, there was a lot of information on uh, a lot of issues related to medications in children. Um, this has improved greatly to some extent, but there's a lot of medications for which we have very little information still, uh, especially medications that we use regularly. Um, and this is much worse for uh, medications that are not well regulated, for example, for Canada, no, as we discussed, one of the projects that we'll talk about in a minute is um, related to cannabis use in, in, uh, in children or in, in special, you know, in special um, uh, stage of life. Stage of life. Um, so after, after I, I spent some time in Canada and I, uh, I did research, I decided to go back to Argentina, mostly for family reasons, and I did, I spent uh, quite a, few, a bit of time there uh, working as a pediatrician, but also doing research in neglected diseases, mostly in, in development and drug for children or drugs for children uh, with some neglected diseases that are uh, endemic of um, 
in different parts of the world, especially in Latin America, like Chagas disease, uh, but also other parasitic diseases. So for some of those didn't really have um, medications that were studied in children. So we managed to study and develop some medications that are now approved for use in children and for which we collected a lot of data. Uh, after that, I decided that almost three years ago to return to Canada to, do, to work here in London as London Health Sciences Centre. Um, and my work here is as, as the, the head of the division of clinical pharma, pediatric clinical pharmacology. Um, so I have clinical duties, but I also do research. And there's a few things that I'm doing right now, although COVID does, uh, has really uh, put a stop to, or at least a pause to, a lot of the projects that we were hoping to to start when I when I came back to Canada. Um, so that that's a, a bit of an overview of my you no know, personal research and, and it's a professional background. Uh, I don't know if there, if you'd like me to give more details or you'd like to me me to discuss the to to, to talk about the projects. Yeah, the projects would be great. Um, we gave a little bit of uh, background about. Uh, the overarching topics, but it would be great if you went into more details about them. Okay, so um, there are a few potential projects projects that that we that that could be done as uh, you know for for a group of students. Um, that exactly the type of so the specifics depend a bit, little bit on the background of the uh, people who would uh, eventually do these projects. Um, the, the the two systematic reviews or, or the, the two projects or, or some of the projects that we discussed so far um, are in the area of uh, use of cannabis uh, in children or in, in, and in pregnancy. Um, there's a lot of, uh, medic of use of cannabis as a medication and also cannabinoids and cannabis derivatives, uh, other cannabinoids, not just the tetrahydrocannabinol. Those have been in use no, informally for many years, formally for a few years, um, in some in pediatrics for some specific conditions, mostly for refractory seizures, for children who have seizures that are, have not responded to other medications, uh, but also for if they've been used, it's been used for other conditions such as autism spectrum disorder attention deficit disorder and some other uh, uh, conditions where the patient may have, the pediatric patient may have some behavioral issues that uh, for which uh, uh, the cannabinoid or, ca or cannabinoidal seem to have some beneficial effects. Now, fortunately, there's not a lot of information on these uh, uses, um, especially on two fronts. One is uh, on the adverse drug reaction side of uh, uh, side of of, uh, of the pharmacological spectrum, where we use these medications, but we're not we don't have a lot of knowledge about what the side effects, especially long term, are, uh, and on drug interactions. So we we have some I, some speculation on uh, the, the interaction with other medications of the of uh, cannabic of the trihydrocannabinol and cannabinoidal, but. Uh, it's not really well studied, and there are some newer dr uh, mechanisms for drug interaction that have, haven't been really um, looked into in depth. Um, so the, the the proposal um, or, or some of the proposals were to uh, carry out systematic um, review, for example, of um, the the mechanisms and the the potential drug interactions with of these medications. Um, and there, there are some, some publications already, not a lot, so it, it would be interesting to uh, collect and, and summarize this uh, in a systematic way. Uh, for, for adverse drug reactions related to this medication, it would also be interesting to, to collect and, and summarize the information in systematic uh, what, using a systematic review approach. Um, and, and use of cannabis in pregnancy is, is another topic that it's uh, possible to um, study more depth. There's some some data out there, but um, it should be no, nobody has really put it together uh, in uh, in a systematic way. And there's a lot of uh, things that have been described uh, as far in potential uh, side effects or consequences of using cannabis in pregnancy by some uh, authors that has have not been found by others. 
So it would be interesting to put all this data together and uh, and try to come up with a conclusion or at least with an estimate of risk. So I don't know. I know we discussed other things. I, I don't know if these are the, the projects that you mentioned before. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry I missed the, the, the earlier part. Yeah, so I think one of the points that you brought up, Dr. Garcia, is that there are so many different directions that you can take this. And it's also up to um, whoever's enrolled in the program to discuss more extensively, Dr. Garcia, uh, to go with the specific direction. But of course, Dr. Garcia, you also pointed out that it is a very complicated process to decide uh, overarching narrative. Um, and it is an ongoing process that we can't give too much details are set in stone as of now. Um, Dr. Garcia, in terms of students, what kind of interest should they have or uh, what kind of expectations do you want to have for from the students who are planning to apply for this program? So um, for sure they should have some form of biological interest uh, because of the, all of these uh, things are, are related to biology and in particular to pharmacology. Um, so, so uh, I, I would, I think that it would be a bit more interesting for for people with an interest in medications and, or, or drugs in general. Um, depending on the on the specifics of the of the project, uh, so the, 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 there are different things that can be done, and, and some of these things can be done by a student or students who have a more general background, for example, uh, doing a systematic review of uh, drug interactions with cannabis can probably be done with, with stu by students who have a, a general pharmacology, bio, no, uh, undergraduate medical uh, sciences background. Uh, working with studying adverse drug reactions may require a bit more uh, interest and or, or knowledge in, in medical pharmaceutical sciences. Uh, so that would require someone who at least has some, some background in pharmacology, but also is interested in learning a bit more of, uh, about medical sciences or, or pharmaceutical sciences in general. Um, there may be other projects for that, or, or the projects could be twisted um, if uh, a student has a more uh, sociology type of interest. So there's a lot of uh, interest in the consequences of uh, pregnant women using cannabis from this society perspective. Um, I am interested in that to some extent, but it, it's, uh, no, it, it may not be uh, the perfect match because uh, I, I don't have a lot of experience with that, but it's possible to discuss. I know people who are interested in doing these things and might be interested in, in having people do a systematic review with them and I could help, but uh, but you would require a bit more uh, thought. So Dr. Garcia, we also have a huge diversity of applicants here today. Um, sorry, um, from first year to all the way to fourth year, all of whom are undergraduates. Um, mm -hmm. Would there be any sort of advice or personal stories that you'd like to share in terms of obtaining research experience for the first time and doing this type of rigorous systematic review project in a remote setting? Um, so, so for research in general, it, it's a bit more um, more complex. So systematic reviews are relatively, so they're, they're a very good way to start. Actually, some people think that they, are, they should be mandatory for most research projects as a first step uh, to do a systematic review and actually get a good idea of what's out there not just what your what the supervisor suggested as one or two nice papers to read. Uh, because it's it's very common for people when they actually do a systematic uh, um, do a systematic type of research into the into the literature, it's very common to find that on one side it's uh, some of the things that they were actually going to look into have already been looked into by other people. But also it's very useful to find uh, and understand the areas where it's not clear, uh, the, the data is not clear or the information has not been well obtained or, or this, the experiments have not been well done. Uh, usually advances are in, in science are, are step by step and they depend on finding what other people missed. Uh, and for that, you have to actually know what other people did. So to be able to, to, to 
kind of look at what they did and how they did it and figure out different ways to do it and try to find different answers uh, or, or, or improve on, the, on what they found. Uh, for, for systematic review, I think you know, my only advice is that people should do as many as they can. It's, they're, they're excellent exercises from the perspective of uh, critical thinking and, and uh, collecting the data and analyzing data, and they're not difficult to do. They're actually pretty simple from a methodological point of view. Even when people try to do meta-analysis, which is a slightly more uh, sophisticated, but it's really, you know, there's a lot of software uh, that can, that, that, that it's out there that can simplify pretty much everything related to that. Um, and it's actually, you know, and, and on the other hand, because it's a, it's an interesting exercise. It's, in many cases, it's a very, it's relatively easy to publish too. So, you no, know, it's a, for a starting student, it's a great thing to do. So, Dr. Yeah. Garcia, you, sorry, um, throughout the re review process of the applications, you will be at part of the interview process to some extent, and you will be working with these students very closely. Um, in the next few months. I was wondering if you had any sort of advice to give these people um, who are interested in working with you and in the topic, how should they express that passion and what kind of values do you think are important in uh, creating a very impactful research and eventually perhaps a publication or abstract presentation at the end of the program in August? Uh -huh. It it's usually changes a bit depending on the project. In general, it's it's uh, no. There there are a few things that are important. One is to be very patient. Uh, a lot of uh, supervisors are really busy, and some of us are really distracted too. Uh, so so being patient with a supervisor is really really a survival advantage. Um, just otherwise, it's, it's hard to keep. You know, if, if you get frustrated with them. Uh, forgetting or, or or not getting up with what you're doing, it's uh, it's it's hard to get along very easily. Um, the uh, other uh, the other important survival advantage is uh, to be very stubborn and and, and persistent and also consistent, but mostly persistent. Uh, in many cases, uh, the supervisors, especially when you're doing a project that is not in close contact with them. So it's, for example, if you're doing systematic review and you meet every uh, every week or every other week, sometimes they may uh, they, they may forget meetings or, or not be completely uh, up to date with what you were supposed to discuss. You have to let people, rem make people remember uh, and, and, and force them to be, uh, to pay attention for just to, to put it uh, mildly. <laughs> so, what you're and, and for that you need a, you need to be focused and, and and you know contact them ahead of time and get uh, send them a list of topics that you want to discuss and insist that you no know, and, and and be insistent with uh, not being rude but just be insistent with emails and and reminders that you know how things are going and what you expect or what you like to discuss or how would how do you think things should be going uh, in the in the Coming months, I mean, your super, the supervisor will also let you know how they think things should go and how they are going. But it's it's important to also provide your perspective um, and, and your and your you know, your ideas and your start answering some of the questions that you guys have. So uh, I see some questions here in the chat. I'll start answering them. And if you guys want to ask it too, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask. Uh, I'll be happy to answer. And we have we'll have another Q and A session at the end as well. So this person asked if um, students under the Faculty of Health Science are not eligible to apply. And unfortunately, that is the case. Uh, we are unfortunately, have to, we have to limit this uh, opportunity to people who are in basic medical sciences or sciences. The, another person asks if the CGPA, the cumulative GPA includes courses from the first semester of this year. Uh, yes. Uh, just. I think you guys should just send us the unofficial transcript that is on Student Center at this point, which I believe does include 
the first semester grades. We also have a question about the weekly time commitment of the program. So this is gonna be a systematic review conducted in a team setting over four months. So I would say that it will be very difficult for someone to balance working on this project with working on something else. So I think the, the weekly time commitment, uh, it's difficult to give a number at this point because again, depends on the project and depends on the team you're working with. But I would say it's definitely not as much as a full-time research job. However, it's certainly not something that you might be able to handle with another full-time job, if that's what you guys are wondering. Someone asked if people with uh, BSc in psychology can apply. Uh, and unfortunately, just to repeat myself, uh, we are only opening this program to students in sciences or medical sciences. And uh, same goes for nursing students. Does basic medical sciences include third year med sci? Yes, so we, we are opening it up to anyone in uh, medical sciences or science. So yes, third year is, is eligible, yes. We also have a question about how many spots are available in this program. So we have uh, six spots uh, for students in this program. And we also have a question about how many students would be per team. Uh, again, uh, maybe I should have mentioned this earlier, but uh, you guys will be fleshing out your research topics with Dr. Garcia Bernison later on after you get accepted. And depending on the project, it could be anywhere from two to four people on a team. If you're in first year, you're, uh, just send us the unofficial transcript and yeah, it, it would include only the first semester courses. So yeah. That, that, that's correct. It is unfortunately unpaid. Uh, it's a volunteer opportunity. Um, we are just getting started and in the future we hope to make it paid and secure some sources of funding, but for now it is unpaid unfortunately. We have this question about program being in person versus online and this program is going to be virtual and online. It's a systematic review. It's a remote project, so you're not going to have to be in any particular location. The second question is about applications being reviewed on a rolling basis. Uh, so the applications are not gonna be reviewed on a rolling basis. We will only evaluate them after the due date of March 1st. So don't worry about any advantage submitting early or later. As long as it's before the deadline, you're good. Um, um, yeah, so the next question is, would the program be synchronous, asynchronous, or a combination of both? Uh, so Dr. Garcia, I'm sure you have your preferences in managing a group of students and. Um, I was wondering, we were wondering if you can speak to what kind of interactions would you be expecting from students? Like, would there be weekly meetings or is it also mostly going to be asynchronous work and then coming back together and updating each other what, what they've done on a weekly basis? Uh, what will the experience look like? So uh, um, thanks for the question. That, that's, uh, th I think that's important to to. to have a, a clear uh, perspective of how things work. Um, in general, there's a, there's a combination. Most of the work would be asynchronous. So um, I think students should be able to work on their own, searching for information, collecting, uh, putting together, analyzing to some extent. And there would be meetings, hopefully weekly, uh, depending on how the project is going, maybe weekly, maybe bi-weekly. Um, to to review how things are going and what what roadblocks they may have found and what difficulties they they, they are having with uh, with the work, but most of the work would be uh, ideally on their own uh, with some input from me and for certain meetings. Hopefully, at some point the meetings may uh, we may be able to meet in person, but for now, given how things are going, COVID, they, we have to assume that a lot of those will be. By Zoom, hopefully my Zoom will work. By Zoom or some other uh, virtual uh, platform. 
Thank you for that answer, Dr. Garcia. So another question we have here is, should our statement of interest be confined to the topics we covered here, AKA uh, the systematic reviews about the cannabis, or should we express our general interest in research and the areas we hope to get into? Um, this is an interesting question. Um, I believe the question right now is phrased so that it's more general, but if you do have a specific interest in Dr. Garcia's background, I believe that would be a plus. Um, that means you will be a better fit to the program and with Dr. Garcia's interests. So we do encourage you to uh, be specific as you can, but do not pressure yourself into doing so. Uh, we simply want to see what your passion is like. And we were going to evaluate more on your interest during the interview stage, which we will email uh, details to the successful applicants. Um, Dr. Garcia, would you like to speak towards what kind of interest students should express uh, at the interview stage where you um, will be participating in? Um, I think you summarized it pretty well. Uh, so the, uh, expressing a general interest in research, I think is important, but it's, it's also a bit uh, uh, a, a, a given as being that they, they are applying to, to kind of do a research project. Uh, if anyone has a specific interest that overlaps with my uh, research interests, it would be nice to know. And there, there's there's a possibility to discuss other topics if if uh, they are more interested in, for example, drug development for neglected diseases or for rare diseases or other uh, areas. But you know, in general, I think the main thing would be to. Um, I mean, the, the main two, two topics that we're offering right now are the, the ones related to cannabis, uh, but we can discuss a little bit if, if uh, there are other strong interests. Thank you for that, Dr. Thank Garcia. Uh, um, there, was a, there was another question up there I think that we missed. Uh, this, this is about reporting the cumulative GPA, and it asks whether we should include grades from just last year or just last semester. Uh, so the cumulative GPA would include all your grades in university, whichever, how, however many that may be. So if you're in first year, that would probably just include the first semester. But if you're in second year, that would include the entire first year and the first semester of second year and so on. And feel free to ask any more questions or hop on the mic to ask them. If you don't want to type, uh, we're here. We're here for about next 10 minutes, I'd say. So Rudra, maybe we can uh, call it the event here. And for any other questions, feel free to email us at corelondon at gmail.com. So C-O-U-H-R, London. And we can answer more questions there. Um, again, we wanted to emphasize the applications that are due at this time. So the link beneath that, it's live now. You can go type that into your browser and you can access the whole thing in one page. And we will be accepting it till until March 1st. Um, but otherwise, we first of all, we apologize about the technical difficulties encountered in various parts of this event. Um, well, certainly unexpected, but we are really thankful for everyone sticking through the event. Um, and we also wanted to give our sincerest great uh, thanks to our uh, esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Garcia. Um, Dr. Garcia, thank you so much for attending this event um, and giving so much information and some of your backgrounds about uh, to these potential applicants who might be working with you over the summer. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this and for inviting me. It's, it's really a pleasure. With that, um, thank you so much for attending everyone and we will end the event here tonight. Have a great rest of your day. And we look forward to reading your applications in the coming few weeks. And good luck. Don't hesitate to send emails to Dr. Garcia or the core team. Uh, we'd love to connect with you guys. Thank you, everyone. Feel free to reach out to us on Instagram and Facebook as well. Um, the marketing team will be there to answer any questions you may have. And there will be a recording of this event, uh, of this event posted in the next 24 hours. So uh, any slides or any questions you may have from that as well, uh, just let us know. So thank you so much.